If there ever comes a time you need to resend a previously sent email because maybe the person that you sent it to accidentally deleted it or can't find it or needs a reminder, in any case, instead of retyping it in over again and trying to remember what you typed in, as you recall in an earlier training video, every email message that you send off, a copy of it is automatically stored over in the sent items folder. Oh, isn't that handy? Go ahead and select it. And oh, that's horrifying. It keeps track of everything. So anybody can track what I'm sending off to everybody. Well, you can come over here and hit the X to delete it to the deleted items folder. And then from there, do a permanent deletion. In any case, we'll cover that later on. But for right now, if I need to resend the email that I sent off to Carrie, the one about our new website, find it, double click on it, open it up and resend it. From the message tab here, you want to go over to the move group and click on the more move actions drop down arrow and there it is resend this message click on it opens up a copy of it in a new email message with the same person that we sent it to their email address subject and the body of the message great all I have to do is go ahead and click send and away it goes now I've done this before when it comes to some support items where I get a lot of people asking the same question and instead of retyping in the same answer over and over again I send it off once like let's say to Carrie and then I just bring it up and, well, of course, I'm going to delete her email address. If I want to send it off to somebody else who asked the same question, that's going to get the same answer. Like, let's say, oh, there we go. Type in S for Shaggy Norville. Hit the tab key. And then come down here and, of course, be sure to change their name. So I double click on the word to select the entire word quickly and then type in Shaggy. Now, I made the mistake enough times where I go ahead in my excitement I update the email address and I forget to change the name and I click send. So it goes to Shaggy and it says, hi, Carrie. And then they, of course, respond usually and go, I'm not Carrie. And I'm like, oh, you caught me. I was trying to be efficient and make it sound personable when actually it's the same answer that I don't want to retype over and over and over again in every email address. So I did the resend message feature. And then, of course, go ahead and send it off and away it goes. You can edit sent or receive messages, and why would you want to do that? Well, for sent messages, sometimes after I send off a message, I'll be like, oh, hey, here's a personal note about what I just sent that I don't want them to see, but I wanted to tie to the message that I sent to them. To do that, as you recall in an earlier training video when we sent Carrie an email message about our new website, every email message you send off, a copy of it is automatically stored over in the sent items folder. So go to the folder, and there it is, new website. Double click on it. And to add text, delete text from the copy of the original message that was sent to her, come up here on the message tab, go to the move group, and click on the drop down arrow for more move actions, and select edit message. And the cursor is flashing down below, so you can go ahead and delete, or in my case, add. Be sure to add images of the website next time to make the email more engaging than just plain text. And then when I'm done, be sure to save the work and then close out. So next time when I open it up, double click, there's my personal note. Of course, you may want to highlight that or color that to offset it against the rest of the text so you can be flagged. Because as you recall in the previous training video, you can actually resend this message again. So if you do that by coming up here on the message tab to the move group and again, click on the same drop down arrow, more move actions to resend the message. It's going to send your personal note with it. So you want to make sure you delete it. Then you can go ahead and send it unless you want to send them that personal note. Let's go ahead and close out and not send it off. Now, what about the subject? Now, it's important for me that I edit the subject. When it comes to either prioritizing or arranging my email messages, especially the ones that I've received in my inbox, you can do it also with sent email messages. But new to Outlook 2016, instead of coming up here, you know, the message tab to the move group, and clicking on the More Move Actions drop down arrow to edit the message. Although you can edit the body of the message, you can't do this in Outlook 2016, coming up here and typing because it doesn't do anything. However, what you need to do is come over here and expand the message header arrow, click on it, and when you expand it, that you'll notice that it's no longer bold, but it's now normal sized text, as it were. Now you can go ahead and edit it and delete it, type in whatever you want, or something that probably makes more sense to you when you get an email message from somebody else. But this is a sent email message, so you can make changes here. In any case, when you're done, be sure to save your work, and it will save it as thus. And let me go ahead and type it back in the E. And if you go ahead and collapse it, well, you can't edit it. But when I expand it, I can come in here and make my changes.
So you can do that for sent messages. Let me close out of here and not save it and go to my inbox. You can also do that for received messages. So let me come up here to see if there's an email message that we can receive from Carrie. I asked her to send me one. Let's come up here and click on, instead of waiting for the automatic send and receive that I set up, click on send receive. So it sends, and if there's anything, oh, there it is. Oh, isn't that fancy? It came in and it's right there. Let me move off of it so it can fade out. So there's the message. And there's the reading pane, so I don't have to open up the message. I can just go ahead and look over here and read what she wrote. Hi, Kurt. Totally bodacious website. But watch your language. Good monkeys. G-O-L. Guffaw out loud. Instead of laugh out loud. Carrie. Now to edit the message, either the subject here or the body of the message, let's go ahead and double-click to open it up so we can get the full view. And then again from the message tab, just as we did in the sent email message, go to the move group. And then click on the drop down arrow for more move actions and edit the message. And then we can go ahead and type in, delete things, add additional things to the received message. And then, of course, to be able to update the subject. So when it's regarding the new website, I can add something in addition to it, say something like use the quote in the message for marketing purposes. Now remember, in order to edit the subject, the message header can't be collapsed. So if it's collapsed, well, I come up here and I try to delete that. It doesn't work. When I go ahead and expand it, okay, now I can go ahead and make the changes to it. And I can come down here and make the changes when I'm done. Be sure to save your work and then close out. And then I can go back, of course, double click to open it up and come down here. And I'm not in edit mode, but with the message header expanded, I can come up here in the subject line and make changes. So the only time you need to edit to come up here and click on the drop down arrow to edit the message is when you want to edit the body of the message. If you want to edit the subject, then just go ahead and expand the message header so you got tiny text as opposed to it being collapsed in large bold text. I can type in all I want or hit the backspace key and it won't allow me to edit it. What you're looking at here is an email that I created that I want to send off to Carrie. And there's her email address in the to field, kheffernan at videotrainingpro.com. The subject is ghost hunting trip. And the message, hi Carrie, what ghost hunting places do you have for our team to visit this Friday night? Something spooky, I hope. In any case, I want to show you how you can format text within the body of the message because you can apply formatting to the subject. For example, I can click anywhere in the body and up here on the message tab in the basic text group, I get the formatting options like B for bold, I for italics, U for underline that I don't get. Watch, they'll disappear when I click in the subject. So we can't format the subject. In any case, let's come down here as an example. When I hover over the text, I get what's called the I beam, an uppercase I, that allows me to click and drag and select the text that I want to apply formatting to. And why would you want to do that? Maybe to place special emphasis or to have fun to make your emails a little bit more lively than just plain text. In any case, when I select my ghost hunting text, I get what's called a mini formatting toolbar when I move up and over to the right. When I move down and away, it starts to fade away, kind of like a ghost. Let's go ahead and move back up to it. And let's click on B for bold, I for italics, and you can apply all that formatting, including changing the font type. So you can click on the drop down arrow and sort it alphabetically. And when you hover over one, you can see it's giving us a preview there. Well, I can't point there because I move off of it. In any case, I'll hover over Adobe Garamon Pro and you can see the preview. Or you can come up here if you know the font and delete Arial and then just type it in like Comic. And there it is, Comic Sans, and it gives you a preview. Well, it did when I was on it. Now I'm back on it. And if you like it, go ahead and hit the Tab key and we can continue on the size of it. Click on the drop down arrow and let's go to 18. That's getting pretty big. And then the color, you can click on the letter A with the color bar underneath it and it will apply in this case what looks to be purple. The default is red. If not, and you want more than a single color than just the default color, well, click on the drop down arrow and there you go. Let's hover over, it gives us a preview. And the name of this square is blue accent five darker 25%. Ooh, that's kind of spooky, but let's go to a standard color. There you go, purple. Select it, and when I'm done, I can go ahead and click off, and the mini formatting toolbar disappears. So to bring it back up, you can click and drag to reselect the text, and there it is. If you move away, it disappears, and if you don't want to reselect it, just go ahead and right click on the selection, 
and it brings up the mini formatting toolbar as well as the shortcut menu where you can cut, copy, and well, paste your text somewhere else if you like, but we'll come back to that in just a second. I want to keep it simple for the mini formatting toolbar here. Well, for example, let me click off when I still have the text selected. I can come up here on the message tab to the basic text group and deselect some of the formats and also change the colors to well, orange works, orange accent too, that is. Select it. You can also come up here and click on the format text tab and there's the font group that has the same formatting options. B for bold, I for italics, U for underline. Now that brings up a good point. When you're applying formatting or you're trying to apply formatting to a message and these formats are not available, you may want to come over here to the format text tab because in the format group it may be selected as plain text. So the three options are HTML which is for hypertext markup language and you can see in the pop-up that HTML messages can contain formatting and are compatible with most email readers as opposed to let's see rich text which is only compatible with Microsoft Outlook and Microsoft Exchange. So if all you're doing is sending emails to somebody else who has Outlook or Exchange you're good to go. If I select that it doesn't change this at all, so no difference there. But it's only compatible with those who are on Outlook or the Exchange. And then finally, plain text, it's just as it says, it can contain no formatting. So if it's on plain text, select HTML and you're good to go. If you do select plain text, after you applied formatting to it, it says, oh, you can't do this. It's got to be plain. And if you're okay with that, then click continue. If not, click cancel. When I click continue, wipes it clean. Let's go ahead and hit undo, go back to the way it was, and we got the HTML selected. And if you want to be able to clear all the formatting without deselecting or trying to reselect the default font, you can just come over here on the Format Text tab to the Font Group, and there's the Clear All Formatting. You can also do it on the Message tab as well, and go right there, Clear All Formatting, and we're back to where we started. And then really quick, some simple cut, copy, or paste options with the text selected. You can either right click on it and in the shortcut menu you have the pair of scissors to cut it and it moves it right to the clipboard so that's active and when you're ready you can go ahead and click paste and it pastes it right back because that's where my cursor was at so right back in the same place. You can go ahead and select it and let's do right click to copy. You can come to another part of the email message and come up here and click paste, 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 and just show that you're very obsessed with ghost hunting. I'm not going to do that. Let's hit the undo button several times. Thank goodness for undo. Or I can redo my undo, but let's undo and go back to my original message here. And then finally, there's a lot of options when it comes to formatting your text, and that's going to be Microsoft Word. So if you want to learn more about all the different formatting that you can do to your text, in fact, let me come up here and click on the Format Text tab. That also includes paragraphs, paragraph alignments, the codes, the indents. Well, go ahead and watch my Microsoft Word training video on paragraphs and fonts and formattings. I go to it in greater detail than what I'm going to do here because Outlook wasn't meant to be a word processing program, but it does pick up and bring in a lot of the elements for Microsoft Word. But for right now, I'll certainly give you enough to get you going to be able to work with when it comes to working with your text here in the body of your message. What you're looking at here is an email message that I want to send off to carry. But before I do, do you see the red squigglies underneath the words and the one blue squiggly? According to Outlook, the red squigglies underneath those words are words that it considers misspelled. And the blue squiggly is a grammatical error or a contextual. So like for what do you think? No, it's supposed to be spelled as D-O. Now it doesn't capture everything, like for example the sales trend. Well, the word sales is correct, but not in context. It should be S-A-L-E-S. And then how about this one right here? When will you have time to discuss this? It should have a blue squiggly because that's supposed to be a question and not a statement ending with a period. In any case, to go ahead and clean this up and to fix all these errors really fast, you can simply hover over the error, give it a right click, and you get a shortcut menu with some suggestions like QTR with the period. Let's go ahead and left click on that and then right click on quarter to quarter, right click on month and select month and then right click on do to get the correct spelling of do and then Kurt, oh come on, that's the way I spell my name. Let's give it a right click and see what options I get like Curti, oh that's not cool. Let's go down to, well, I can ignore all, meaning that it'll ignore every spelling of my name 
if I had more than just the single here occurred within the body of the message and not have any of those red squiggly underlines underneath it, or I can add it to the dictionary. That way it'll never consider the spelling of K-I-R-T as being a misspelled word. Let's go ahead and do ignore all, and it looks good. Now that's one way. Let me go ahead and hit undo several times, and it won't undo what I fixed in the subject, so I have to click up here and delete the period and then click off, and there you go. Now it looks at it as being misspelled. And the other way to go ahead and check for spelling errors within your email message is coming up here, clicking on the review tab, going to the proofing group, and there it is, spelling and grammar. And you can see in the pop-up, you can hit the F7 key as a shortcut. Now what this does is it starts from the top and it works throughout the email message, going from each misspelled word or grammatically incorrect word in a linear fashion, as opposed to you just right-clicking on each word that you can find, like a video game, pew, 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 pew. I mean, oh, you're all over the place, right? In any case, when you click on it, it opens up and it goes to the first misspelled word in the subject, and there it is, colored in red, and then the suggestions, QTR period, I like that. So come over here and click change. Now, if you had QTR throughout your entire message, like maybe 5, 10, 20 times, if you click on change all, it'll automatically update all of them to what you selected here in the suggestions. So I just have it once, I'll just click change, and then it goes to the next misspelled word. Okay, it skipped QTR, but... Maybe my Outlook has a bug. In any case, let's see if it picks it back up after I fixed month here. There it is, month. Click change. Okay, went back. Okay, that's kind of freaky. In any case, it's still checking for everything, so I'm good. There's quarter. Click change. And then do to the correct spelling of do. Click change. That's great. And then Kurt. Well, I can ignore it once, this one misspelled word, but if I had additional Kurt's with the same spelling, I can ignore all of them throughout the entire body of the message, or I can add it to the dictionary. Let's do that. So if I click on Add to Dictionary, Spelling and Grammar Check is complete, click OK, and now it'll never consider K-I-R-T as being a misspelled word, either in this message or in any new messages that I create. If I ignored it, it would just be in this message, and all new messages would have it as being misspelled. Now, if I made a mistake and I'm like, no, it should be misspelled, to fix it, well, come with me, good neighbor, click on the File tab, go backstage down to Options, the mail category selected by default, if not, select it, and then come over here and click on Spelling and Autocorrect, and then click on Custom Dictionaries, and select Custom Dictionary there, and then click on Edit Word List, and there it is. So Outlook has its own dictionary, but in addition to that, you've got your own, this custom dictionary that you can, you know, add words to like K-I-R-T. But if I select it and delete it and click OK and click OK, it'll no longer consider it as a misspelled word. And if you made some changes and you want to be able to recheck for spelling errors in the message here, then come down here and click on Recheck Email. When you click on it, it says the operation resets the spelling checker and the grammar checker so that Outlook will recheck words and grammar you previously checked and chose to ignore. Do you want to continue? Yes. Click OK, click OK, and give it a second. There you go. Now we're back. And one last thing that I want to show you, let me go ahead and hit undo and get back to all the misspelled words here, is that if you had a lot of text within the body of the message, so much so that you have to scroll down to see the rest, well, you may not pick up on the misspelled words because you don't see the red squigglies in front of you. So what you can do before you send this off is there's a feature that will automatically turn on the spell check and check for all the errors before it sends it off. So to do that, come up here, click on the File tab, go down to Options, Mail Category, then come over here to the ABCs, and then check, always check spelling before sending. Check that, click OK. And so if I'm in a hurry or I've got a lot of misspelled words that I don't see down below, I'm not focused, and I'm like, hey, let's just go ahead and send it. And I'm like, hey, what's the, oh, I got some misspelled words. Whew, that was close. I don't want to look unprofessional here by sending out an email that looks like I'm being sloppy and not checking for spelling errors. In any case, I can go through it really quick and say, let's do change and Kurt. Let's just ignore once. And then quarter, we want to change. And then month, let's, there's the month that's selected. Click change. And then do to the correct spelling of do. Click change. And then as soon as it's done checking, away it goes. It went out to the out box and sent it right out. The autocorrect feature will automatically correct commonly misspelled words or what Outlook has in its database as being misspelled. 
So for example, when I type in the word this, T-I-H-S, I know I misspelled it, but when I hit the space bar, the autocorrect feature automatically kicks in and takes a look at the word that came in front of that space, and if it finds a match within its database, it automatically changes it to the word that it has when I hit the space bar to this. And if I'm like, wait a second, that was a proper name. I don't want it to be converted or automatically changed by the autocorrect feature. You can hover back over the word that it changed and you get that thin little blue line underneath the, the T there. Hover over that and it expands into a smart tag with the autocorrect options, the pop-up. Click on the drop-down arrow and there's the options. You can undo automatic corrections to this. You can stop auto-capitalizing the first letter of sentences or you can stop automatically correcting T-I-H-S. So undo the corrections altogether. We can do that. We're back to T-I-H-S, and I can go ahead and continue typing. And then if I'm like, eh, let me go back. You can do that in this session. But if I save the email and close out of it and reopen it back up, I won't get that little tag there. So if I click on the drop-down arrow, I can change my mind as many times as I'd like here and redo it. How about if we do this? Stop automatically correcting this. When I do that and I select it, it removes the T-I-H-S from the database as being misspelled and replacing it with T-H-I-S. So when I save it and I close out and then there's, well, here's the draft folder. I've got one in there and it's right there in the main working area. Double click, open it back up and I'm like, oh, where's that little smart tag? Again, it was only for that session. So if I want to fix this to, well, I can go ahead and fix it right now. Type in T-I-H-I, -I. there we go, we're good. But when I type it in again, T-I-H-S, hit the space bar. Remember, we said stop automatically correcting this. So if I'd like this back in the autocorrect option, the database to convert and to change that specific type of misspelled word into T-H-I-S, then come with me, good neighbor. Up here, click on the File tab, go backstage, down to Options. The Mail category is selected by default, so just come over here, and if not, select it, and click on Spelling and Autocorrect. And there's the autocorrect options. Click on that. And here you go. And by the way, up at the top, you've got correct two initial capitals. So if you type two uppercase letters, it'll automatically correct the second one, as you can see, CA, and drop the uppercase for A. So it's lowercase a. And then let's see, capitalize the first letter of sentences. So it did two autocorrections when I typed in T H I S because the T in this was lowercase and it was the first letter of a sentence. And then, of course, it was misspelled. It was supposed to be H-I-S and not I-H-S. So there's that. And then down below, you can type in, like, T-I-H-S and look down into its database, and you'll see that it doesn't have T-I-H-S to be replaced with T-H-I-S, this. So if it's not there, go ahead and type it in, T-H-I-S, and then click Add. And now you can see it's in the database. So when somebody types in T-I-H-S, it'll replace it with the correct spelling. And you can go ahead and do some more things like, let's do B-R-G. Get the tab key and let's type in best regards. Ooh, isn't that fancy? You can go ahead and just simply type three letters and automatically kicks in the rest of the text for you. And then go ahead and click add. And then maybe for April Fools, you can go ahead and type in the person's name, whoever works at this workstation, when they type in, like, Bob, and you can replace it, Kurt is the best, or whatever your name is. In any case, click Add, and then have a good laugh. But remember that we only use Outlook for good, so don't go overboard with this. Let's go ahead and click OK and take all this for a test drive here, and click OK again, OK. So now when I type in T-I-H-S, hit the space bar, it turns it to this. Oh, that's cool. Let's hit Enter a couple of times. And then how about BRG space, best regards, oh, that's cool. And then when Bob types in his name, Kurt is the best, what the fudge? And then they can go back and hover over it if they watch my training video and go, ah, somebody's been messing with the autocorrect options. And then, of course, they can click on the drop-down arrow, change it, stop automatically correcting Bob. And then, of course, if they want to go back to the autocorrect options and, you know, they type in Bob, well, there it is, Kurt is the best, select it, hit delete. It's gone, and then also BRG, it's right there with it selected. You can delete it, and it will be gone. And then go ahead and click Close. You can do it that way, or like I said, you know, when you hover over and click on the autocorrect options and say Stop Automatically Correcting This, it's the same as opening up that autocorrect window and doing a search and hitting the Delete button right there. Because here, Stop means to delete. 
that from its database. So it'll no longer correct TIHS. Now, if you want to attach some files, pictures, videos to your email message, you can do it one of many ways. One way is to come up here on the Message tab and go to the Include group and click on Attach File. Or if you're on the Insert tab, you got the same group, Include, click on Attach File. Or if you have your window restored so it doesn't fill up the entire screen and you can see, well, let me minimize the window behind it down to the taskbar, your desktop where you've got pictures, files, you can click and drag them right into the body of the message. In fact, let me go ahead and open up the Exercises folder, double click. And I've got my document here. Now, if you don't see the extension after the name of the file, .docx or .xlsx, don't worry about that. That's proprietary to my computer. Basically, it tells the operating system what program to open up this file in, and I'd like to see that. And so if you want to learn more about extensions, then watch my Windows training video on extensions. In any case, I'm just going to go ahead and click and drag a file into the body of the message. It won't allow you to drag it into the subject or the two or carbon copy fields. So in the body, let go, and there you go. It's attached. Oh, isn't that fun? Let's go ahead and close out of there. And then if I'm like, oh, I made a mistake, you can do one of a couple of things. Either right click on it and you get a shortcut menu of options, or let me click off, you can click on the corresponding drop down arrow and you get the same menu of options. So you can open it, quickly print it, save it as, meaning that you can save a copy of it to the desktop, or remove the attachment, cut, copy, or select all. Let's remove it and let's restore this. And let me show you the other ways. So if you're on the message, well, let's do it from the Insert tab, the Include group. Click on the Attach File drop-down arrow. When you do that, it's going to show you a list of all the recent items you were working on. So that way, if you've been working on the outline or you recently attached it, click on it. Hey, there it is. Select that and automatically attaches it. Now, if it's not in that shortcut list, let's go to the Message tab to the Include group. Same thing, Attach File and you're like, it's not one of the recent items, go ahead and click on Browse PC. And, well, you can come over here in the navigation pane and go to the desktop, and then over in the main window, it's in the Exercises folder. On the desktop, double-click, and hey, there we go. So if I want to include all the rest besides the outline document, I can select the Import Contacts Excel Workbook. That was made in an earlier version of Excel. Hold down the control key so I can do nonlinear selections, multiple selections that is. I've selected these three. Click on insert and voila, there we go. Now I have a total of four attachments. Now something you need to know about attachments like your Word document, that once you attach it, it's separate from the actual document in my exercises folder on the desktop. For example, after I attach it, if I want to make some personal changes to the document, double click on it to open it up. And then let's see, if I deleted some text here, well, let's just go ahead and really exaggerate. Let's delete everything so I just have unique and click Save. It saves it as the attachment. It doesn't overwrite the original document that you inserted, well, in this case, my exercises folder on my desktop, into the email message. So it should be untouched. Only the attachment has been changed. You want to check it out? Alrighty. Let's go ahead and close out of here and minimize this down to the taskbar and go to my exercises folder, double click and double click outline and it's still there including unique. Oh that's unique. Let's go ahead and close out of there and restore the window here and so double click on the outline document that's been attached to it and like I said it only affects changes that you made to the attachment and not the original file on my desktop in the exercises folder. Close out. And that's good to know because maybe after you attach it, you're like, okay, I want to make it proprietary to this person and delete or insert some additional text. Go for it and then just be sure to save it when you're done. And when you close out, it's right there. Now, in addition to file image attachments, pictures, videos, audio, you can also attach Outlook items. So back up here on the Message tab, go to the Include group. And there you go, attach item, that's an Outlook item. As you can see in the pop-up, attach a business card, calendar, or an other Outlook item. So click on the drop-down arrow, and if it's not a business card or a calendar, maybe it's another email message, like one that she sent to me that she wants to have me resend back to her because maybe she deleted it. In any case, go ahead and choose Outlook item, 
opens it up, it has a list of all the folders that contains those items or store those items, like for email messages in your inbox or drafts or messages that you sent. Any calendar, contacts, journals, let's keep it simple. So in my inbox, she sent me this. She replied, and now she wants me to send it back to her. In any case, with it selected, if I had more, just select the one that you want to go ahead and attach to the email message. And you can do it either as an attachment or as text only. So if I do it as an attachment and click OK, oh, I gotta scroll down. There you go. There's the Outlook item and the subject with the RE, meaning that she replied to my email message and used quote for marketing purposes. So she's got it there. Let's go ahead and right click on it and remove it and say that instead of attaching that Outlook item, let's go ahead and insert it as text. That was the other option. So come up here and click on Attach Item. Let's do Outlook Item again. We're in the inbox, and in the inbox, it's the same email. So we can do it as text, select it. When I click OK, wherever my cursor was at, that's where it's going to insert the contents of this email. So when I click OK, let's see where the cursor was at. Just right at the end there. So I can go ahead and hit Enter a couple of times. And from that point all the way down, is all the contents from that email message. So maybe you want to attach it there, and that way you can go ahead and delete some of the stuff that's not pertinent and update it or add some additional text to it. And if not, let me just go ahead and delete that, and we're back to where we started. How about other Outlook items? See how they go. Come up here to the Message tab, Include, Attach Items. Let's do a business card. Ooh, we got quite a few of them. Well, I don't have that many fans. The ones that I do have here are made up. In any case, you can choose it from here or say other business cards. Let's do other and see what we got. And this is the contacts. That's my default contacts folder. And I made additional contacts folder called personal. One's for my business and the other are my personal friends. Let's go ahead and select that. And oh, I don't have too many personal friends. I better go back to business. In any case, your flavor. Go ahead and choose who you want to include. And you can hold down the control key to go ahead and do multiple selections. Or if you select one, hold down the shift key and select, well, three after. It'll select everything from the initial all the way down to the last selection. That is holding the shift key. Let's just go ahead and do Barney Fife. And then click OK to see what it looks like. And there we go. And if everything looks grisly, let's go ahead and send that off to Carrie. Click on Send. Oh, let's go restore our Outlook program. And... It's out of the outbox. It's gone. Now remember, every time you send off an email, it creates a copy of it over here in the sent items folder. So select it. And there it is with the paper clip to indicate that you got attachments to it. Now that's important because when it comes to backing up your Outlook program, if you got things that you sent off like huge video files, that's going to take up a lot more bandwidth when it comes to backing it up. Or maybe your IT person has put a, a size limit on your sent items folder or maybe other folders within your data file. So you can do one of a couple of things. You can either go ahead and open it back up on the sent file and say, okay, well, I've got a huge file here of a picture. I know it's 421 kilobytes, but let's pretend it's huge, like maybe 50 megabytes, or maybe it's a video file, two gigabytes. I mean, that's really huge. In any case, you can go ahead and right click on it and remove it and then save your message so it's no longer sitting in your inbox. Now, if you do want to keep it for reference purposes later on, well, the other options you can do is, of course, you can right-click on it and do a Save As, and then save that to a folder on your desktop. That works, and then you'll have those images that you send off, but then I assume you already have them on your computer because we attached it to it. But if you want to keep these images with this email message and you're just set on doing that, close out, you can create another folder here that's, well, if you're connected to the Exchange server, that there are size limits that the IT person put on some of these folders. Create another folder and then just go ahead and drag that item into that other folder, a folder that doesn't have a size limit put on it. And I'll show you that in a later training video. I mean, for me, there are times when I send off a video that I'm like, oh, that's okay. I don't want it to be sitting here in the sent items folder when I back up Outlook because if I have a lot of images and videos just junking it up, I got a huge data file for Outlook because of all that and it takes a long time to back up everything. So I may go ahead and open up and remove them from my sent items folder in those email messages. Whatever works best for you, there's some options. 
Now let's go ahead and see what it looks like when somebody sends us an email message with a bunch of attachments. In fact, I had Carrie go ahead and take the email that I sent to her with my attachments and just forward it back to me. So let's go back to our inbox. Let's rush this by coming up here and clicking on Send Receive and not wait for it to automatically pull in. But hey, there we go from Carrie. And it's right there. Select it. Over in the reading pane, I can get a preview of everything there. And hi, Kurt, here are the attachments you wanted me to send back to you, Carrie. Oh, isn't that nice? And I can click on the drop down arrow and go ahead and open it up. But instead of doing it from the reading pane, let's just go ahead and double click to open it up. And from here, you can actually select the document in this case and get a preview of it down below and or the Excel spreadsheets or the contact card that we sent off Barney Fife all his information down below and even the image hey these guys are crazy they're having so much fun and then to go back to the message to read why these attachments are here hopefully they explained it oh look the image dimension that's nice click on back to the message and hi Kurt here are the attachments you wanted me to send back to you and then of course if they were from her the originals and they weren't what I sent to her and I want to be able to get this out of the email message because it's taking up a lot of space like in the inbox and I want to keep the email in the inbox but not all these images or videos or whatever she sent me that takes up a lot of space. Again, you can simply right click and go down to save as and then go to the desktop and it's video training or I can just rename that and call it two dudes having fun. Click save and then let's come down below in our Windows operating system and click on the show desktop and you can see it right on my desktop over on the left hand side. See so when I go over there, it brings it back. This is just a peak preview. Or I can click on it, minimize everything down to the taskbar, so I can come on the desktop, and there's the two dudes, double click. Whoa, they're having intense fun. Close out, and then to restore everything, or maybe just the window here, let's go ahead and just do the email message, click on the corresponding button, and we're back to where we started. Now a couple things you need to know when it comes to attachments is that if somebody sends you an email and you don't see the colored icon here, it's like a white sheet of paper. One thing that may have happened is that it doesn't have an extension to the name, so the operating system can't tell what program to open up this file in. That's why I like seeing an extensions because I looked at them enough to go, okay, XLS is for Excel. XLS is Excel, but that's an earlier version. And in any case, I could go ahead and hit reply and say, okay, the file that you sent me, what program did you open it up in? And if she said it was Excel, then I would know that I could go ahead and edit this after I saved it to my desktop and add the extension.xls. So I can tell the operating system to open up this file in the Excel program. In any case, that gets a little bit intense. You can watch my Windows training video on extensions. But not only that, you may actually see, let me close out of here and restore Outlook, where you get a paper clip. But when you look over here, you don't see anything there. Or when you double click to open it up, you don't see any attachments. Well, why is there a paper clip showing you that there's attachments when there aren't any? Well, Outlook will block attached files that it considers as dangerous. For example, it doesn't like .exe files, extensions for executable programs, because if you double click on it, you get no chance of saving your computer if there's a virus in there, because it may immediately start executing some code that will destroy everything. So it blocks some of those files. Now for the files that it does accept, it's, well, obviously Microsoft's own favorites, the Word documents, Excel, images in JPEG or PNG format or other formats, you know, contacts, Adobe PDF documents, and also zip files. So if you do have an executable file or other files that doesn't allow you to view them here to be able to open them up, then go ahead and zip them up or compress them into a zip file, and then you'll be able to send them off and the person will get the zip file, double click to open it up, decompress it and extract those files from it or those executable files and any other files that Outlook considers dangerous. In any case, be safe with that and just know if somebody sends you an email and you just see a paper clip and you're like, hey, I don't see anything here. Go ahead and reply back to them and say, look, what did you send me? Because Outlook is blocking it and you need to put it in a zip file so I can receive it. And then I'll just go ahead and double click on the zip file, open it up and extract that to my desktop and be able to open up those contents. Well, let's do this. Let me hit two birds with one stone. Let me go ahead and restore this down so I can see the desktop. In fact, I'm not going to be able to do it from here as easy. Let me double click to open up the message again and then restore that down. 
come over here. And on my desktop, let me give it a right click and go down to New and create a folder. And the default name's New Folder. That's fine. Just click off to solidify it. And then let's go ahead and select one of the files. In fact, hold down the Shift key and click on all the rest. And another way to move these to your desktop is just with the click and drag. But I'm going to move it over into the folder. And you can see my pointer has a little fuzzy block underneath it, and it's got a plus sign. The fuzzy block is the contents that I'm dragging, and the plus sign means that it's not actually moving it. The plus is in addition, meaning that it's creating a copy of what I have selected and putting it over when I let go into the new folder. So there in the new folder, if I want to go ahead and send these back to Carrie, because let's pretend that these are programs that Outlook blocks. So to go ahead and zip this up and send it to her, we can, well, right click on the folder. And I have what's called WinZip that I can go ahead and add it to the zip file. When you guys right click on your folder, you'll get something else if you don't have WinZip installed on your computer. So when you right click, for me it's add to zip file. So it's up to you if you want to have something that does a little bit more than just the default, what Windows has. I've got this zip program that when I go ahead and add to zip file, I can just say, yeah, go ahead and click Add. And it says, where do you want the zip file to be? I want it on the desktop and select that as the zip folder, as the place to add the compressed or zip folder or zip file to. Click OK. And then it's on the desktop. Let's go ahead and minimize that down. Minim oh, it's right there. See? So that's what it looks like with the extension .zip. Again, you won't see the extensions, but I do because it's what I chose to see in my Windows operating system here. In which case, you got this little crunch on this filing cabinet that's saying that this is compressed. When you hover over it, you can see in the pop-up, it's got a list of all those files. So when I want to go ahead and respond to Carrie with what I have here, or just create a new email message, let's just do that. Click on the Home tab, click on New Email. If I want to insert it, I can come over here on the Message tab to the Include group. And since it's the most recent thing I've been working on, when I click on Attach File, it's just right there. I mean, how cool is that? Click on it, and there it is. It's got all the contents in that zip file that when I send it to Carrie, Outlook won't block it. And then she can just go ahead and open it up and extract the contents therein. For example, let me go ahead and close out of here and say No. Restore that. And I'm going to have Carrie go ahead and send off to us a zip file so we know what it looks like and know what to do. And then just come up here and click on Send and Receive to speed things up. And there you go. You got the little paper clip. There's an attachment. Go ahead and select it. And that's what it looks like. A vise, a clamp around a filing cabinet. And select it. And it says you should only preview files from a trustworthy source. Am I trustworthy? Of course I am. So I can click on Preview. And it shows me in the zip file, so cool, that you can see that I've got the VCF, which is the business card, and then XLS, the Excel file for import contacts, documents, and the picture. So to go ahead and extract that, give it a double click. It says you should only open up attachments from a trustworthy source. I say open, and there's the contents there. And if you're not using WinZip, You'll get the option to go ahead and click on the Browse button to select, like your desktop, to unzip the contents within the folder. And for me, it's just this one right up here. Let's see, one click to unzip. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click on the drop down arrow and unzip to my PC. So when I click on that, I want it to be to my desktop. So I'll expand that, go to Users, to Training, I keep navigating down there to my desktop. Well, I better have a folder for that, new folder, and call it something spiffy. Hit enter, and then double click to empty the contents into that folder and say unzip. And not only did it unzip it, but it opened up the spiffy folder with those files within that zip file. Cool. And so it's on the desktop. We can close out of here, close out of the WinZip program. And let's minimize this down to the taskbar. And there's my spiffy folder. Double click to open it up and everything's there. Great. Now, if you want something besides just the plain white as the background color for the body of the message, well, come up here and click on Options and let's go to the Themes group to Page Color. And you can see in the pop up, 
add a splash of color to your document. All right, go ahead and click on the drop down arrow and let's find that splash. That's orange accent to lighter 60%. Click on it and it adds it. Of course, you can come back, click on page color and go back to no color, but and let's do something a bit more special. Like let's do some fill effects, click on it. And on the gradient tab, let's choose two colors. So it goes from one color to the next. And for the second color, let me click on the drop down arrow and choose this one right here. Gold accent for lighter 60%. Select that. And ooh, look at the shading styles for horizontal. Going from a peach to a gold or gold to a peach or peach, gold, peach. Or you can do it vertically or let's do diagonal up. And for the four variants that are available for diagonal up, I'll choose the first one from peach diagonally to the gold, select it, click okie dokie, and oh, that's kind of fun. Nice Easter colors. Next, if you want to insert a picture into the body of the message, not as an attachment, then come up here, click on the insert tab, go to the illustrations group, and click on picture pictures. And let's browse for it. It's on the desktop in my exercises folder, double click, and there they are, double click, and ooh, it's full size, that's huge. Well, let's go ahead and choose like one of a couple of options to resize this picture. I can either hover over one of the circles there, the resizing handles for the picture, either in the upper left hand corner or the top middle, or if you wanna scroll over right hand side, middle right hand side, or bottom corner. In any case, when you hover over it, you get arrows pointing in opposite directions. You can click and drag to push it in, and that looks a little bit more manageable here. Or you can do it from the right middle resizing handle, but if you do that, these guys are gonna get squished. Ah! Let's go ahead and hit undo, which by the way, if you ever get into a situation where you make a lot of changes here to the image and you want to go back to the way it was, the default, when you first inserted it, you can come up here with the picture selected and go to the Related Contextual Format tab because when you click off, it disappears. When you select the image, it reappears because that tab is proprietary to what you have selected here, which is the image. That is these commands on this Related Contextual Format tab. So in the Adjust group, you can go ahead and click on the drop-down arrow to reset picture where you can, well, if you made a lot of changes to it, including the size, you want to go back to the way it was, click on it, and, whoa, we're back. Now, you can do it that way when it comes to resizing it, or let's come back up here on the Format tab to the Size group instead of, you know, scrolling to or coming up here to click and drag to resize it. You can do it numerically, so if you want it to be, well, there's the width and there's the height. If you want it to be 3 inches, just go ahead and type in 3. And it's going to keep the aspect ratio locked or the picture in proportion. So even though I'm shrinking up the width, it'll also do it in proportion to the height. So when I hit enter, you see how it readjusts the height to keep it in proportion. So the width isn't shrunk and vertically it's still really tall. And you can make the changes to that if you'd like by coming up here in the size group and click its expandable dialog box button. And it's that guy right there, lock aspect ratio. Now I go over this when it comes to cropping, resizing your images and rotating them and flipping them and all that in my Word and PowerPoint training videos. Outlook is just to send and receive email messages, but I want to give you enough because you do do some word processing within the body of the message and also, you know, inserting images and so on. But again, as I mentioned in an earlier training video, Outlook will use elements of PowerPoint, also Microsoft Word, and instead of re-recording all the same things over again, you can go ahead and watch my word training videos and or PowerPoint because PowerPoint is an image based presentation program and word is well the word processing program. So to get more details, go ahead and watch that. Otherwise, I'll keep it simple here. And you got the reset button here. If you want to go back to the way it was, click on reset and well, everything changes. Click okie dokie and ah, oh, we're back. Well, I'm going to go back to three inches. So quickly type in three in the width, hit enter and there we go. Now with it right here, if I want to click and drag it and move it up before this paragraph, it doesn't look really good, does it? Unless I want to come in here and hit enter a couple of times to push it below. You can do that, or let me hit undo a couple of times. You can, with it selected, come over here and click on the layout options, click on it, and I cover this extensively in my Microsoft Word training videos. This is just enough to get you going or enough to work with so you're not completely stuck. 
and you can see down below that it's going to keep it in line with text but you got some wrapping options yo 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 let's go ahead and wrap it with the text and you can see you got a shape within the lines that shape looks like a horseshoe so you can have the image in line with the other lines there or the text the paragraph you can have it tight so the text when you move the image is right up next to the image or you can have it through it where it goes right through the image or just on the top and bottom of the image I mean, just go ahead and play with it and again watch my word training videos behind let's do in front of the text that way when you click and drag well it's in front of the text but you got freedom to actually move it around anywhere within the body of the message and I like that and then click off now if you have a lot of pictures within your email message just a ton of them because you're sending your entire photo album of your trip you know one picture below after another well that's gonna be probably a large email and so what you can do is you can compress the pictures to do that go ahead and select at least one of the pictures and then come up here to the format tab go to the adjust group and you're looking at that button right there compress pictures click on it and in the window you can have compression applied to only the picture that you have selected but if you want to apply it to all the pictures in the body of your message then uncheck it and then delete cropped areas of the picture we haven't talked about cropping but again when it comes to formatting working with pictures in greater detail there's PowerPoint you can watch my training videos on that and Microsoft Word but what it does is that when you cut off a part of the picture that you can't see, it still keeps that cut off part behind the scenes in case if you want to bring it back. But if you cropped a lot of pictures, there's no sense if you're not going to be showing them to keep them. So it'll actually delete those cropped areas of the pictures permanently if you leave that check. You know, to save on size when it comes to an email message with a lot of images. And then down below the resolution, well, I don't get high fidelity. I get the HD option, 330 pixels per inch, which is good quality for high definition displays. Or you can do print. If you're sending this off to somebody, it doesn't need to be high def, just that they do want to print it off. Or if it's for the web, where they can go ahead and take these and load them up on their web pages or show up on the wall through a projector. Or the least of which is just for email viewing, 96 pixels per inch, minimized document size for sharing. If I select that, click OK, you'll see, uh, I can kind of see it there, some degradation, or it's kind of fuzzy, but it reduces the size of the picture and all the other pictures that if I had more in the body of the message. And if you don't like that, you're like, oh, that's horrifying. Well, you can go ahead and undo it, or click on the compressed pictures again and say, mm, let's go HD. And then, well, you can use the default resolution, which is what it came with which if it's a higher resolution than the HD, well, that's the way to go. So choose your flavor. I'll use default, click OK, and that means that I'm not scaling back on the size or the quality of the image to reduce the size of the image and hence overall the email message here. One last thing I want to go over is up here on the Insert tab in the Illustrations group is taking a snapshot or a screenshot of the window that's open up on your desktop and inserting it into your document here or the body of the message let me click off you hit enter a couple of times so when I come up here and click on screenshot the available windows that are open you can actually take a snapshot of that window so I have my word document that, that's opened you can see down below that's opened on another screen I've got two screens open and then I've got my actual Outlook program that's opened well you got the message but behind that I have the program now if I minimize that down to the taskbar and I come back up here and click on screenshot I only get one so keep that in mind you can have a lot of windows open or programs but if they're minimized then when it comes to taking a snapshot of that entire window it won't see it until you go ahead and click on the corresponding button to restore it and let's go back to the email message here and then click on screenshot hey now it's back so I can go ahead and simply select it and there's the snapshot and because this guy right here has the text wrapping of being in front it's actually over the screenshot of my Outlook program here the inbox and stuff in any case you can go ahead and select that image and then well resize it and do the same thing that we did to this let me go ahead and hit undo you can do that or what are the other options click on insert click on screenshot if you just want a clipping of it and not the entire screen then go ahead and click on screen clipping but before I do that if I have a lot of windows that are open let me do this let me minimize that down to the taskbar I got this one let me minimize that 
let me open up the exercises folder and let's open up an image here and let's restore that down so I have the image, the folder, the Outlook program, and then my email message here. So when I come back up here on insert screenshot, and I just want a clipping of maybe this guy's face right here, or maybe just part of the email program that I have open. In any case, when I click on screen clipping, I only get one choice. Now let me show you this before we go ahead and decide how we can actually choose another window to clip and not the one that's well that we're looking at now. So if I just click and drag the black cross. It puts his mug right there. I mean, isn't that cool? But what if I didn't want that? What if I actually wanted this right here? My Outlook program, and I just wanted a screen clipping of the files that are contained in the WinZip file. How do I do that? Well, here's the secret. The last window that you touch prior to going back to doing a screen clipping is going to be the one that's available that's going to be on top. So since I touched the Outlook program, let's go ahead and with it selected, hit the Delete key. When I come back up here to the Insert tab and go to the Illustrations to Screenshot and I do a screen clipping, I last touched the Outlook program, so that's going to be on top. Besides all the other windows I have, like the Exercises folder, and I'm like, oh, I wanted to do a screenshot of what was in my Exercises folder. Well, to get out of this, you can hit the Escape key and then just touch it. So that's the last thing you touched. Then come back to your email message. Again, insert, illustration, screenshot, screen clipping, and there you go. Wait for it. Then it turns to a milky white to let you know you're in clipping mode. And then go ahead with the black cross, click and drag that part of the window that you want to clip. And there you go. It's clipped. Oh, isn't that fun? And then click on the drop down arrow. Let's do in front of text so I can move it around and put it right there. And as a reminder, like I said, I don't want to beat this into you, but when it comes to doing a lot of word processing, images, clipping, videos, audio, all that, I'm showing you the basics of how you can attach it to your emails to send them off. But when you want to do something getting as fancy as this and rotating them, clicking and dragging and going this way, whoa, we're in a battle for our lives here. Then you want to watch my word training video on inserting and modifying and editing pictures as well as PowerPoint or watch them both. SmartArt are graphics used to visually communicate information like processes, cycles, or relationships like in a company showing the hierarchical structure of its employees like in an organization chart, which is the example I'm going to be going over here. But before we insert the SmartArt, I need to know where the cursor is flashing at because that's where it's going to dump it into, and I'm good with it right there. So to insert the SmartArt, I'm going to come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Illustrations group, and it's right there, SmartArt. Go ahead and click on it. And it's divided into three sections. The left hand side are the categories, in the middle are the items within each category. And then over to the right, you get a pretty picture and the description. So you can go ahead and scroll through all the items, but if you want to narrow it down and like take a look at the processes, go ahead and click on process, hover over it, there's the name, as you can see in the pop up, basic process, select it. There's the picture, and the description says that it's used to show progression or sequential steps in a task, process, or workflow. And for example, like step one, clean out the fridge. Step two, wipe out the fridge. And then step three, restock the fridge. Something simple like that. But in this example, we're going to be looking at the hierarchy. So let's select that. And more specifically, the item is the organization chart. Select it. There's the picture. And it says it's used to show hierarchical information or reporting relationships in an organization. I'm OK with it. Click OK. And there it is. You get five shapes. You can add or remove the shapes, but I'll go over that later on. But first of all, the top shape is the president, the head honcho, the CEO, and hopefully that's you. And so what we want to do is go ahead and type in your name with it selected. And so I'll type in mine, and that's all the text you can type because it can only fit so much. No, I'm kidding. You can just go ahead and keep on typing, and it'll do a best fit or an auto fit. So it resizes the text to make sure it fits all within that shape and it will apply to all the other shapes as well so that way it can keep it proportion because you don't want one shape or Microsoft doesn't want you to have one shape that has text about yay big and in another shape really big another shape really small it keeps them all at the same size but you can overwrite that if you want to go ahead and select it and in the mini formatting toolbar change the size of it that's fine but we'll keep it simple here and then below that when you have a shape off to the side that's going to be your assistant and then below that, if it's not off to the side, they're going to be your subordinates. 
So let's go ahead and type in our assistant here. The name is going to be, and then hit enter. And then for my other shapes, the subordinates, let's say they're going to be the vice presidents. I have three VPs in my company. So the first one's going to be hit enter VP. And that's it. Now, of course, you may have more or less than this. And so to add additional shapes or to remove the shapes, like for example, let's say that we fired Carrie. She's no longer with the company. You can go ahead and select the border of the shape until you can see, well, the resizing handles all the way around it, which by the way, when you hover over one of the resizing handles, it actually, when you click and drag it, resizes it. And oh, that's huge. Let's go ahead and undo that. Just hit the delete key on the keyboard and she's gone. But I don't want to do that. Let's hit undo and she's back. And so that's how you delete a shape. Now to add shapes, come up here on its related contextual, well, the Smart Art Tools, the Design tab, or the Format tab. We're going to be working on the Design tab, which you won't see if you click off of the Smart Art, disappears. So it's proprietary to what we're working on, the Smart Art here. So we have the shape selected, and then you got its canvas here, that when you add additional shapes to squeeze them in, it'll reduce the size. And so you can go ahead and resize the canvas to make the shapes larger again, like for example, up here on the Design tab in the Create Graphic group, you can add a shape. Now make sure you know what shape you have selected that you want to add a shape to, because it's going to be adding it in relation to Carrie, and I don't want to add a subordinate to her. So let's go ahead and do it to me. Select my shape, come back up here, click on the drop down arrow, and you can add a shape after or before. What that means is before, it'll be at the same level, but it'll be in front as opposed to after, which will be behind or over to the right-hand side. So if I select before, oh man, that's not cool. He's at the same level as I am, and I got nobody with me. I'm the head honcho. Let's hit the delete key. Ooh, that was close. So you can go ahead and add him at the same level, or again, with the same shape selected, come up here and click on the drop-down arrow. You can add a shape above, which I don't want to do that because nobody's above me, but if they were, why not? or you can do below. So if I do below, hey, I have another one at the same level as all the other VPs. So keeping that thought in mind, if you want to go ahead and add a subordinate to Handy Mandy, you'd select that shape and then come up here and go ahead and click on Add Shape to do below. And there you go. And then go back up to Handy Mandy and do Add Another Shape below. So we have two workers or managers, whatever you want to call them, they're subordinates to Handy Mandy. And then over here, well, that's going to be another VP, so we can do. And then for these other shapes, we'll just keep it simple. We'll say worker one and worker two. And like I said, when you add the shapes, it reduces the other shapes to fit within the canvas here. So you want to hover over the resizing handle, bottom right-hand corner, if you'd like. That works best for me. And click and drag and make it a little bit bigger there. And as far as assistants go, let's go ahead and select my shape again. Come back up here, click on Add Shape because we did after, before, and below, not above. And the assistant, so I can add another assistant to me. Select that, and there's the second one right there. And then just type in a name. Hit Enter. And that's how you add the shapes. Next, up here in the Create Graphic group, is you can promote or demote them. So you can see when I hover over it, it'll increase the level of the selected bullet or shape. So I gotta be careful what shapes I have selected here. So if I select like, for example, worker number one, and I say, give him a promotion. When I click on it, guess what level he's gonna be at? That's right, the same level as the VPs. Oh, that's horrifying, or maybe he is. In any case, now we just have one subordinate here, and that's to the previous subordinate, who's now a VP. But let me go ahead and undo that and go back to the way it was here, or better yet, we can redo that and then give them a demotion, right? So worker one, let's go ahead and click on demote. And he goes back to being a subordinate to Handy Mandy. Okay, then next, let's come back up here, and you've got right to left, so you can switch the layout, which is gonna be over the axle here, I call it the axle. So Carrie being on the left will flip over to the right, and Sophia will flip over to the left-hand side. So all those who are on the left will go to the right. All those who are on the right will go to the left. So when I click on switch, it flips. There you go. Let me go ahead and flip it back, and we're back to where we started.
And let's come up here and let's move them up or down. Now, if you move them up, it's going to move the shape over to the left hand side and down. It's going to be to the right. So if you have your VPs in seniority, you want to move them up in seniority. That could be one way of working with your ups and downs. So move them up, moves them over to the left hand side. And let's say that Handy Mandy is more senior than Shaggy. So select Handy, click Move Up, and it takes his subordinates with them because they're tied to Handy Mandy. And then finally, Let's take a look at the layout, click on the drop down arrow, and again it's based upon the shape you have selected. So right now, looking at Handy Mandy and the two subordinates, they are right hanging. So if I want to flip that to go left hanging, they just flip over. So you can change the layout there. And then up here, let's go with the design. You have the different layouts. You can hover over it, get a preview of it, name and title, organization chart. Let's see, you got other options. I'll let you go through all those. You can click on the More button to look at others. Click off. You can change the colors. Click on the drop down arrow and choose something fancy, colorful, like colorful range accent colors two to three. Sounds fascinating. Select that. And then you've got the visual style. Click on the More button and let's do 3D, something polished. Select that. And if you don't like any of it, you want to go back to the way it was, then you can come up here and click on Reset Graphic, and it goes back to what we had when we first started. And then, of course, on the Format tab, click on Format, and it's for your shapes. You can select a shape style for any of the shapes, hover over it, and there you go. You can get a preview of it down below, as you can see in the main working area, in the body of the message. And then the Word Art Styles, hover over that. Uh, that doesn't look too pretty, but nonetheless, you can do it. And then for your text field, text outline, text effects, just select the text and make the change. I'm not going to go over it into great detail here because I do that in my PowerPoint and Word training videos about the smart art and the different ways you can format and change the design of it. So for greater detail, go ahead and watch that. Otherwise, I want to keep it simple here because this is not more of an email program than it is about word processing or working with shapes, as the other two programs are, again, PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. Let me go ahead and click off. If that looks all good, then just go ahead and click send, and away it goes. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.